Today we're going to talk about the Cretaceous. Uh, this is the last period uh, that the Mesozoic era uh, lasted for. And if you'll remember, the uh, end Cretaceous mass extinction is known as the KT boundary. That's the boundary between the Mesozoic there, if you look at that uh, diagram verse history, and the Cenozoic, which is the recent era that is what we're in now at the end of the Cenozoic. So uh, this is the end time of the dinosaurs. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to say. It, definitely the dinosaurs, their heyday was the Jurassic, and, and throughout the Cretaceous, um, they, they were changing. There was a lot of different dinosaurs. Like, they, they, weren't, they didn't all survive right up to the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, some of them were already disappearing, and there was a lot of change. If there's one thing we can say about evolution throughout the fossil record is that it just continually changes. So the dinosaurs were experiencing changes as well right up until the end uh, when they got wiped out. So we're going to take a look at all of that today. Um, the picture there on the left is, I believe, a picture from the White Cliffs of Dover, a uh, famous uh, chalk deposit uh, that is Cretaceous in age uh, over in England. Um, I've never visited it myself, but it's pretty striking. It's pretty stunning. It's very bright white. Um, that's composed of all the skeletons of little things called uh, radiolarians and diatoms that uh, died and sunk to the bottoms of the oceans. And just there were so many of them, they just built up these huge layers in the bottoms of the oceans. So let's dive in here and take a look at life during the Cretaceous. Oh, before I go on, make sure you kind of understand there. So the Mesozoic, it goes Triassic, Jurassic, and then Cretaceous. So we've got those three periods, and right now we're at the very end, okay, in the Cretaceous. So life during the Cretaceous. We saw a lot of uh, changes in the fish, actually, during the end of the Cretaceous, during throughout the Cretaceous period. Um, telostat uh, fish became the dominant uh, group. These fish had evolved specialized fins. And so if you look at the fin structure on these things, uh, they look much more modern. This is like modern fin structure. They developed a symmetrical tail. If you remember the fishes, uh, the last time we talked uh, through the, I think we were talking Triassic and Jurassic, um, they had those asymmetrical tails where the, the tailbone kind of shot off at an angle there. Um, so these are probably more efficient tails that this moves on into modern day and what modern day fishes look like. Um, so uh, probably not super exciting to you, but yes, the fish were changing as well. Let's look at life in the Cretaceous oceans. So a lot of stuff had changed, but some things had remained the same. Uh, marine reptiles were still really important, like the Mosasaurus. Things were huge, right? 15 meters in length. Um, there were marine turtles swimming about. Uh, we still had ammonites down there. Uh, so, you know, the, the oceans probably looked pretty similar to some of the rest of the Jurassic. Um, there was giant marine monsters down there. Uh, Life on land was starting to look pretty different. Life on land saw the evolution of a brand new group of creatures that would prove to be absolutely essential for all lighter, later life on our planet. It saw the evolution of the flowering plants. So flowering plants are known as angiosperms. And uh, these include, like most of your hardwood trees that you think about, it includes grass, um, it includes uh, pretty much every single plant you might go outside and find. Uh, save things like gymnosperms, like uh, some of the, the pine trees, ginkgos, things like that. They were still dominant during the Cretaceous. Uh, but the important thing is that the flowering plants had finally come about, and they're going to change the landscape forever, right? Totally way more complex than their gymnosperm relatives. Um, just really amazing things. This is a picture of a magnolia, modern day mag magnolia tree. And magnolias are in many respects um, living fossils. They're, they're, they existed during the Cretaceous and they were probably pollinated by a wide variety of different insects. Uh, they hadn't really um, evolved specialization with specific insects yet. So uh, eventually what we're going to see, and we're gonna talk about this next, is that plants are going to co-evolve this tremendous complexity with their pollinators, uh, the insects for the most part. Not that there's not some other pollinators of plants. So let's talk about the co-evolution 
of plants and insects. This is one of the great evolutionary tales of all time. Uh, what happens during the Cretaceous is that plants co-evolve with insects. Now remember, plant insects had been on land already for like 300 million years uh, before flowering plants ever arrive on the scene. So the insects had been there, insects had been like dominating on land well before um, any large or small land animals other than them had, had gotten onto land like, the, like reptiles and amphibians and things like that. Insects were the, the animal that dominated the land. Um, as flowering plants took hold and, and grew, there was a lot that flowering plants could, could uh, compete with. They, were, they had the seed, they had external fertilization where you had you didn't have to have sperm swimming to eggs. You didn't need water. So they could colonize further inland than being trapped near the water. Um, now, as insects and plants co-evolve, uh, there's a lot of like a huge, great new radiation of different insect species and different plant species that come out of this. Um, we see butterflies, moths, ants, bees, all come about out of this radiation because insects are now becoming so intertwined with plants um, that they're inseparable, right? They, they each need each other so much that one can't live without the other. It's a, it's a tremendous symbiosis that's developing here. So during this coevolutionary event, um, let's just kind of describe coevolution here a little bit. The, what coevolution really is, is it's the evolution of interacting species in response to changes in, in each other. So as one species changes, because evolution is always acting on an organism, right, and there's other pressures that are acting on plants and other pressures that are acting on insects, maybe the climate is changing, um, you know, maybe temperatures are changing. There, there's like a million things we could think of here, right, that are going to change plants as evolution acts on them, natural selection. Um, so as the plants change, the insects change with them because the insects are so dependent on the plants. And then as insects change, the plants correspondingly change with the insects. So a change in one species dramatically affects the other species and forces an evolutionary pressure that causes natural selection to select for plants or insects that better fit the other species. It's really pretty cool uh, that this is going on. I mean, it's still going on today. So. Uh, like I said here, many flowering plants have deeply co-evolved with specific pollinators to the effect that a plant can't even be pollinated unless a specific insect actually exists in its area, like the plant's done for, right? And then there's specific insects that are so specific to a specific plant that they can't themselves survive unless that plant actually exists in their environment. So that's how detailed this has gotten. And we can look at the shape, shapes and sizes of flowers um, and how those correspond to the actual pollen transporting parts of the animal, animals themselves, the, the moth or the bee or something like that. Um, so this also brings up another really important point that I wanted to mention here. And it goes all the way back to old Chucky e. D himself. Uh, Darwin actually predicted that there would be a moth with a 28 centimeter long tongue based on the fact that he had found a particular flower that would require something this long to access its, 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 um, its sugars, and that would be the pollinator for this plant. So sometimes you, you often hear, and lo and behold, that of course was discovered later on, um, sometimes you hear people say, well, evolutionary theory is, is not like other sciences, like, like physics and chemistry and things like that because those sciences can make predictions uh, about real world things, like what will happen when we collide these atoms? What will happen when we put these two chemicals together? What will the chemical reaction produce? How much of this um, reactant will be required to produce how much of this product? That sort of thing, right? Um, how much force is required to push this object this far? Right? We can make very specific predictions about that uh, in physics and in chemistry. But the truth is, even though biology deals with living creatures and not inanimate objects, it makes very truthful predictions that can be absolutely tested. 
e even though it seems a little bit different and a little weird to us because the things we're testing are, are living creatures, um, Darwin made a perfect prediction here and uh, lo and behold, it was born out and, and it existed. And this has been done time and time again throughout uh, evolutionary theory. So it does make predictions, absolutely, and we can test those. Okay, let's move forward here. Probably talked about coevolution enough. I could probably talk about dinosaurs for hours, so I'll try and limit myself here just a little bit. Let's look at what the, the scene might have been kind of during the Cretaceous, um, the Cretaceous period. So there would have been a lot of vertebrate faunas, like uh, a lot of different vertebrates on land, and their communities would have been probably similar to like a modern African savanna. So picture like grasslandishly looking areas with little clumps of trees. We've got duck-billed dinosaurs running around, ankylosaurs, um, things like that traveling around the landscape. It might have looked similar in those respects. Uh, let's look at a couple of dinosaurs that really sort of stand out during the Cretaceous. The first one, Iguanodon. So these become uh, the most dominant herbivores of the Cretaceous. Uh, the sauropods, those gigantic monsters with the big long necks uh, that, lump, that looked like they would lumber around but were probably uh, quite decent at walking around on land, th they're declining. So those big monsters are kind of going away and the new, uh, the new one that's going to become the dominant herbivore, the thing that eats plants of this time, uh, is iguanodon. These things get up to like 33 feet long and weigh somewhere around like three tons. Uh, now, iguanodon is interesting. Its name actually means iguana tooth because if you look at the front of its, of its skull there, uh, it doesn't really have a tooth up there, but it's got this sharpened bone, this, this beak, if you will, and, and it's really an, a fantastic adaptation because it's an advancement for tearing off plants and then it's got all these chisel-like teeth along the back, these molar-looking things, uh, that are used for chewing up these grasses. Uh, it's got, it doesn't have teeth at the front. It's got this bony-like pad sort of thing like a sheep does. Uh, so it's, it's very evolved to specifically eat uh, the types of plants that are growing during the Cretaceous. Let's move on to another famous group of dinosaurs, uh, the hadrosaurs. So these are known as the duck-billed dinosaurs. And we mentioned these previously because they were around during the Jurassic. And they've got these huge crests on top of their head, which are bone. Uh, and they're made up of these weird passages. And I know I played for you guys at the sound of somebody blasting air through one of these things. Uh, we don't know for sure exactly what they sounded like. But we do know that these things made noise. Uh, the, the Cretaceous was probably really noisy. Uh, we've got these giant monsters running around trumpeting noises out of the tops of their skulls, right? Um, it was probably pretty noisy. Uh, so you can see the, the direction of airflow here in, in the diagram. It would draw air into its, its mouth, uh, into its lungs, and if it expelled the air um, up through its nasal passages, the, the air would go through this crazy trumpeting tube-like structure and out its nostrils, uh, creating, no doubt, quite the sound, right? So the hadrosaurs, duck-billed dinosaurs, really cool looking. Other life during the Cretaceous. Well, some things that we definitely would recognize from before, right? Good old T-Rex was around. No doubt T-Rex had feathers at some point during its life. We mentioned that previously. Uh, I think we found uh, black actually w was the protein color that they decided uh, they found on some very young um, T-Rex uh, fossils that they discovered. So we have direct evidence. We also have a lot of other inferential evidence uh, to tell us that T-Rex has probably had feathers. So this drawing here could be totally incorrect. Like that thing could have been completely covered in feathers. Feathers do not fossilize well at all. You can imagine they're, they're easily decomposed. It's a hard thing to get a fossil of. Versus bones, of course, very easily fossilized in comparison. Uh, we still had flying vertebrates. Uh, we had reptiles up there, right? We had the birds up there. So birds are around during the Cretaceous. Um, let's look a little closer at the group that T. rex is a part of. These things are, are known sometimes as the sickle-clawed meat eaters. So a sickle is a, is a device that farmers, ancient farmers used to use 
for uh, harvesting crops and grasses and things like that. It's a big hooked, sharpened thing. So if you look at the, the toes on this monster, my gosh, look at the, you've got this big hook shape, right? Why did that evolve? That was specifically for disemboweling prey. So if you, if you have a cat at home, you have great experience with this. Have you ever attempted to pet your cat's belly, like maybe more than twice, right? You know what disembowelment is if you've done that because you get like two pets and then the third one, it's game over. The cat digs its front claws into your, into your arm, bites down on your arm. This is like near universal, so I'm, I'm certain you've probably experienced this. And then the back legs come up and they start just clawing the crap out of your arm, right? So you could picture T-Rex doing something similar, biting down on its prey, right? Uh, maybe at the neck, and then reaching those back legs up and just shredding it with these, these sickle cell claws that it's got, right? Um, and there's a lot of other dinosaurs that are part of uh, T-Rex's group. There's uh, Allosaurus. Oh, T-Rex, by the way, uh, if, if you don't know this, uh, basically means Tyrant Lizard King. So, uh, yeah, right? Terrifying creatures. Um, Allosaurus, uh, we've got Baryonyx. Uh, Baryonyx um, actually meant a heavy claw, right? It had a, it had a one foot long claw on its thumb in this crazy crocodile like head. Uh, so, some of these claws were big. Right? Like really terrifying. Um, but T-Rex, definitely the most iconic of all, uh, probably uh, dinosaurs of all time. Uh, the, the, the largest complete specimen that we have of T-Rex is actually uh, up in the Chicago Field Museum. They named it Sue. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to go up to Chicago, you definitely should go to the Field Museum. It's the coolest part of Chicago, my opinion there for sure. Um, but that thing's like 40 feet long and 12 feet tall, uh, probably weighed in at about like five, five and a half metric tons. This <laughs> is a really huge, huge monster. Um, but yeah, like I said, we've got tremendous amounts of evidence that T-Rex had feathers at least some point during its life, some one stage during its life. Um, we've got, in, in a sense, you could think of it as we've got as much evidence for that as we do that Australopithecines like Lucy actually had hair, right? It would be pretty hard to imagine Lucy not having any hair, right? Australopithecus. Uh, so, because of course she's a, a hominid and all these hominids, uh, uh, all primates have hair, right? So yeah, it'd be pretty hard to imagine that. Other life in the Cretaceous, well, those monstrous crocodiles are still around and they got humongous, up to like 50 feet in length these crocodiles got. Um, and, and yeah, they walked around on land. Uh, you could picture something that big uh, going after a T-Rex, right? I mean, they got huge. So life on land, life in the waters, uh, th there were some monsters about. Pretty interesting stuff. Now, during the Cretaceous, uh, I want to take a look at mammals a little bit, because why? Well, we are a mammal, right? That's why we care. So mammals evolved and this, this uh, picture goes from the bottom up, if you will. Mammals evolved from the therapsids, which was a, a group of reptile-like creatures. I say that because kind of near the end of the therapsids, they start, they start looking uh, part mammal-like, like almost like mammal reptile sort of things, like with the conodonts there. So the, during the late Permian, uh, they mammal, uh, these therapsids uh, have this erect gait. And we talked about how important that was for, for locomotion on land. So they're, they're, they're upright on their four legs. Um, late into the Permian, uh, the therapsids, remember therapsids evolved earlier, uh, there, there, there's like a secondary palate that happens in the roof of their mouth. And you know that we have both a hard and a soft palate in the roofs of our mouths for help with chewing and swallowing food. Um, the arrangement of their toe bones sort of shifts to more of a mammalian pattern of what we have today. Um, later on into the mid-Triassic, uh, so uh, their, their teeth become much more differentiated. They get different types of teeth. So it's, it's not just um, 
not just canines or, or whatever. They, their teeth start to become more complex. Their jawbone starts to develop into what's going to become our ear bones. Then on into the Jurassic, uh, we see the, the evolution of the first really true things that we would actually call mammals. And these things have a slightly different type of a neck bone. Uh, they've got uh, teeth that now have two roots. If you've ever seen a tooth yanked out of a mammal before, you'll notice it's got two root little stalks on it. So the teeth have become different, much more specialized. And then on into the late Cretaceous, the placentals arrive on the scene, which were a placental, right? Our, uh, humans give placental birth. Uh, we don't lay eggs. Uh, we, we don't have a pouch like a marsupial. But those other two groups uh, are still around. Right, The monotremes and the marsupials are still here. They're more ancient types of reproduction in mammals. Um, and then late into the Cretaceous, we see the brain size start to grow. Um, so nothing near like the size of a, of a hominid brain, but the brains are getting larger. Okay, uh, So things, things are starting to look a little, little more modern, if you will, for the mammals near the end of the Cretaceous. They're, they're almost perfectly poised to take over after the dinosaurs bite it, right? So let's look at what things that would be more related to us during the Cretaceous would have looked like. Here is Purgatorius, one of the first fossil primates that we find examples of, and they're around during the Cretaceous, so primates had come on the scene. Uh, these things, what did they look like? This is a drawing here. They, they kind of looked like rats that climbed trees. They were these small, rat-like looking creatures, probably nocturnal, right? You can't picture something like this probably scurrying around too much during the day uh, because the dinosaur is going to snack on it. So probably eating things like insects uh, up in the trees. Uh, but like the primates are, are, are around on the scene. So every, the stage is set, right? Let's look at what the Earth itself looks like, the continents. So the continents... Uh, at the time of the Cretaceous are, are, are pulling apart. Uh, so we had, we had Pangaea, right, the, the, the all land that came together as the supercontinent. And now, near the end of the Cretaceous, the continents are, are totally isolated. Like They have pulled apart enough that it looks really quite modern, right? The seas have opened up. Uh, the, the sea level has risen. So there's not a lot of those little like shallow, oceany sort of plateaus that, that existed uh, throughout other times. The Tethys Seaway has started opening up. And remember we talked about the Tethian Sea. Uh, it was an ocean that existed for, for much of the Mesozoic. And it's actually a really important ocean because most of our oil mining today that happens out in the world's oceans uh, happens because during the, me during the Mesozoic, there was a lot of these algae blooms, these little microplankton that were, that were kind of growing in the Tethian Sea. And their bodies, when they died, they sunk with the little oil that was in their bodies and, and became part of the ocean sediment in a non-oxygen-rich environment down there deep in the oceans. And uh, when they got compressed and squeezed and buried, that became the oil that we now mine today. So yeah, like oil is definitely not infinite. There, there are reserves on our planet and some of them were laid down. Most of them were laid down hundreds of millions of years ago. So we're not really making more of this stuff even if we wanted to keep mining it at, at, at the rate that we would need it if, if we keep growing as a world. So uh, yeah, fossil fuels are limited. Okay, so let's move on to the big one, the mass extinction, which we've already talked about some. So I'm going to be pretty brief here. Uh, the Cretaceous end mass extinction at the KT boundary, uh, every land mammal or, or every land animal weighing more than about 55 pounds bites it. They go extinct. So we're talking about the dinosaurs, save their relatives, the birds, right? The ammonoids, the mosasaurs, like all those big marine reptiles that were swimming around. Um, there's huge reductions in gymnosperms and angiosperms. So plants take a big hit. Um, some things do survive, right? We have, we have crocodiles that survive through this. Uh, the, the wee little mammals survive through this. Uh, lots of different life in the ocean survives through this. The thing that this extinction takes out 
is all the big critters, whether they're in the ocean or they're on land, uh, they get knocked out. And remember we said before, large creatures, as it, largeness is kind of a, a tendency that evolution has uh, to create things that are bigger and bigger and bigger uh, and more specialized. So these larger creatures that required more food and were more specialized in what food they ate, uh, they can't survive rapid climactic change, right? Let alone a nuclear impact, right? But uh, they can't survive the change. So at the KT boundary, we see the annihilation of all these large creatures. We don't see any more above that for a long, long time. Uh, and there's lots of other pieces of evidence for this. Uh, and we looked at quite a bit of that already. One of the, one of the biggest pieces of evidence is the element iridium which is completely rare on Earth, but it's very common in meteorites. So to spread a thin layer of this stuff, which is what that arrow is pointing to right there, uh, across the entire globe uh, definitely had to be some sort of an impact event. I mean, that's, a, that's really good evidence that that happened. We're talking about an asteroid like six miles-ish in diameter, traveling 10 to 13 mile, miles per second. Thing was really moving, hit us an angle, blew up this cloud of dust and smoke, blocked out the sun, right? All that sulfur in the atmosphere that came out of the rocks was real bad stuff. Like a force of 100 million single megaton hydrogen bombs. Like this was, this was a biggie. And the impact, uh, of course, made tidal waves across the ocean, um, tsunamis more appropriately, uh, sent stuff raining down as far away as Wyoming. We see these little microspherules, these melted, globules of glass that rained down and then became buried and then we can dig them out today. Uh, we, we can look at the actual impact site itself, the Chicxulub Crater down there in Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, we, can, we can image it uh, gravitationally and look at the anomalies there and it makes this beautiful outline pattern of a crater. We can look at those cenotes which are all the little uh, holes of water that dot the rim of the crater itself because all of the Limestone got cracked and became rich with caves. Uh, and I showed you a piece of stri striated dolomite uh, from the impact site itself that skidded across the surface of the planet before it came to rest down there in Belize. Uh, so it's some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, and that wraps up the end of the Cretaceous.